said, my name is Alex Hangy, and I'm here today to talk about my dad, Bob Hangy. So I have this little picture. That's him with a much smaller Alex, um, but this is how I like to remember him. Um, but a couple of things you need to know about my dad before I kind of dive into his story is that um, he always fought with my younger sisters on who ate the most ice cream. Another thing I want you to know is that he loved roller coasters and old country folk music. I get my love of history, true crime, and strangely enough, musicals um, from my father. Um, he worked at US Bank my whole life, and on the outside, he may have seemed like the frugal and sometimes stingy banker, but once you got to know him, he was the most generous person you've ever met. And then finally, the most important thing about my dad is that he had four kids and now four grandkids, and he did everything in his life to make sure that we were set up for success. Um, and that was the most important thing to him. So to dive into a little bit of his story towards the end, um, we started noticing some uh, strange symptoms for my dad in April 2015. Uh, these are things like he was a little bit more reserved. Um, sometimes he would say comments and conversation that didn't really match what we were talking about. Um, he would do silly things like put the home phone in his pocket and take it to restaurants, put the bread in the freezer and the ice cream in the fridge, stuff like that. He does seem a little bit more tired overall, and he definitely was more anxious at work, at a job that, like I said, he had for decades. And so my mom sat me and my sister down and said, hey, we're gonna do some tests with your father over the summer um, just to be proactive. And me and my little sister look at each other like, nice dad, you get the summer off. Like, I'm sure it's nothing, like way to go, like no work. Um, at the end of that summer, I remember it was my first day back uh, to the University of Cincinnati. I get a phone call from my mom and she says, okay, after all these tests, we know it's not Alzheimer's or cancer. The first thing I thought was, excuse me, did we think it was Alzheimer's or cancer? Because I was not aware that we were on that caliber of seriousness. And the second thing I thought was, okay, okay, it's not cancer, not, it's not Alzheimer's. Like the worst is behind us, anything else that we can tackle. All right, let's, let's get into it. Like I'm in, I'm in fighting mode now, I'll fight for my dad. Um, and for the next year and a half, two years, he underwent so many different kinds of tests. This uh, included memory tests from general practitioners, MRIs, blood tests, um, cognitive ability tests from uh, neuro uh, psy psych psychologists, um, and they also underwent two spinal taps, which is a pretty intensive operation. Um, and so after all of those tests, nothing really came about. Um, the turning point for me personally was Christmas break of 2016. I was home for the holidays from the University of Cincinnati, and um, it was my first time in a while having like extended amount of time with my dad, and you could just really tell a difference. He was paranoid, he was asking weird questions about the house, how we were paying for it, who was living there, um, and just seemed extra confused. And it really hit a breaking point. Um, one night, uh, it was 2 a.m. and he started pounding at my door. So I'm immediately awake and I just see this terror in his eyes. He's so afraid. And he's saying, Alex, Alex, I need you to help me. So I immediately jump up from my bed, but then I see my mom behind him and she's saying, Bob, please go back to sleep. Please don't bother her. It's okay. So we kind of go into the living room and my dad has his cell phone in one hand and my mom's cell phone in the other. And you could just tell he was terrified. And it was in that moment that uh, it clicked for me that he didn't know where he was. He didn't know who my mom was. And he was threatening to leave at the house. And this was in December when it was freezing cold outside. And so I'm standing there and not knowing what to do. And luckily, 
convinced him to call his older sister, who just happened to still have a landline. I mean, who has a landline? Um, she answered the call and was able to calm him down and get him back to bed. It was at that point that my mom sat the siblings down and said that his paranoia and depression and anxiety, um, symptoms that we didn't really know uh, he had were really, really bad and that he didn't always know who my mom was, which was a crazy idea to have that my dad didn't know who my mom was. Um, so we finally got the name of this strange thing happening to my father in April of 2017. He had Lewy body dementia. It's okay if you don't know what it is, most people don't. But just as cancer is an umbrella of many different diseases, so is dementia. Many people know what Alzheimer's is. That's the most common disease under this umbrella. But Lewy body dementia is actually the second most common disease with no cure under this umbrella. Strangely enough, it's not a rare disease. It affects an estimated 1.4 million individuals and their families in the United States. The reason that it's so um, not well known, even among doctors and medical professionals, is that it is so difficult to diagnose. I explained um, the years that my dad went through tests, and the only way that they were able to identify that it was Lewy body is through a process of elimination and understanding his symptoms. Process of elimination. Um, not everybody is that lucky to be able to go through that process to identify a name to what their loved ones are going through. So a couple of symptoms that come with this disease, I've kind of mentioned a few, depression, anxiety, paranoia. A few others are hallucinations, um, slow movements, trouble walking, um, excessive movement during sleep and acting out dreams and just night terrors. And so sleep is very hard to come by for both the caretaker and the person su suffering Lewy body dementia. Um, there doesn't need to be any family history um, with this disease to exist, which also I think is one of the reasons why it's also very difficult to diagnose. Um, and like I mentioned before, there is no cure and it is terminal. Really treatments are there to try to support um, the loved ones as they're going through this disease. So like I said, we got the name of this disease in April of 2017. And after that, it was just really trying to identify, like trying to identify his specific symptoms and help him through it and find the right medication to make him the most comfortable. Um, however, medication for neurological illnesses like this, unfortunately, are like shots in the dark. Not only does each person react differently to the medication, they also come with their long list of very intense symptoms that sometimes require their own medication just to deal with the symptoms of the first medication. And then of course, if you're on multiple forms of dif different medication, they sometimes can react negatively based on your brain, your body, et cetera. And so it was very, very tough to get his medication right. And my mom practically became um, an expert in medication. <laughs> Um, it kind of came to a head in March of 2018, where she, uh, they went to the hospital and she admitted him to the emergency room to try to figure out his medications. Um, and that's when he was admitted to the psych ward. And as a college student, learning that your father is in the psych ward is a pretty jarring statement and visual. Even though at this point we've gone through years and we understand that like suffering, this is a disease, it's neurological. There's just something about the word psych ward that really just puts you on edge. Um, after, before he was admitted, he had pretty uh, good physical function. He could walk, bathe himself, eat himself, eat, eat by himself, etc. It was really those psych, uh, psychiatric symptoms that he was struggling with. But I mean, the minute, he was admitted to the psych ward, it was like a light switch. He could no longer walk by himself, bathe himself, go to the bathroom by himself. 
feed himself, talking became very difficult. Um, and it was a pretty steady downward uh, slope at that point. Um, on May 1st, 2018, my dad lost his battle to Lewy body dementia. And grief is a weird thing. You have started, we started grieving years ago at this point. I mean, little by little, we were losing the man, father, spouse, loved one um, day by day, little pieces of him we were losing. Um, however, there is definitely something final about death and about knowing that it's done, it is finished. Um, however, another strange thing about these kinds of diseases is there is a large amount of relief. This person that you love so much is no longer struggling, suffering, and is in agony every single day. And so, um, like I said, grief is a weird thing. I always told my mom um, after going through the funeral visitation, et cetera, it's like, I'm gonna write a book, mom. It's gonna be titled, There's No Right Thing to Say, But There Are Wrong Things to Say, A Book of What Not to Say to a Grieving Person. Um, I really think it'd do well. <laughs> um, but, um, and we still miss him every day and we're still grieving and figuring out life without him every day. Um, so that's one person that you now know that suffered from Lewy body dementia, but I bet there's another person that you all know that also suffered from Lewy body dementia that you might not be aware of. His name is Robin Williams. Um, pretty famous guy. If you haven't heard of him, look it up. Um, he's pretty great. Um, he died by apparent suicide in 2014, and it wasn't until after they had the autopsy that they realized that he was suffering severely from Lewy body dementia. There's a documentary about his last few years on earth called Robin's Wish. And to really discuss what this disease did to the man that she loved and the man that America loves. And so a few of um, some of these tidbits from the documentary, I kind of pulled out and I want to share with this group. Um, one of the things that she said was that being at the mercy of something you can't control and not being able to know about it is one of the worst things that she thinks could happen to a person. Um, he was actually diagnosed with Parkinson's the year that he died, which actually happens a lot when um, people actually are suffering from Lewy body dementia. And when that happened, he talked to the doctor and said, do I have Alzheimer's? Do I have dementia? Do I have schizophrenia? Because he knew the depth of his issues were way deeper than uh, the symptoms that you would have with Parkinson's. But he couldn't communicate that and no one else really knew what he was suffering. He would have delusion looping while sleeping and there was a mismatch of reality with what he perceived to be reality and what everybody else did. Um, there's a couple doctors on this documentary that kind of explain the what happens to the brain during this time. Um, the doctor said it's not their heart that's sick, it's the mainframe, the computer. And because there are so many psychiatric changes that are caused by the chemical changes that are happening in the brain, um, they get sick and they have these symptoms like depression, anxiety, hallucinations, paranoia that people don't necessarily identify with for a disease. Um, and so it's hard to diagnose and there's also a stigma with that. Um, like there was a stigma with Robin Williams' death when it was perceived to be suicide. Um, another doctor on this documentary said that there's a tendency to blame people who are responsible for their disease. You don't blame someone when they have cancer. and so. Um, that's why events like this are so important. The last thing that I want to say about this documentary is that um, Robin Williams, his life mission was to help people be less afraid. Um, the last quote of the documentary it was from an interview where he was alive and well, and he said, and I quote, there's a sadness, but then there's a hope. The thing that matters are others, way beyond yourself. The self goes away. 
There are a lot of amazing people out there to be grateful for and a loving God. Other than that, good luck. That's what life is about. And so the reason I tell you about my dad and the reason that I talk about Robin Williams is for three main takeaways. The first one is awareness matters. That's why there are events like these happening. It matters to find a cure, to understand what these symptoms are, to try to relieve the suffering of so many sick people, to understand how we can prevent this disease in the first place. It also matters to caregivers and the ill. During the documentary, it was heartbreaking to see Robin Williams so sick and for his family and friends and loved ones to not know and not have a name to what was physically attacking Robin Williams at all time. It mattered to us when we finally had a name, there is a sense of peace that comes with that. So awareness matters. The second one is it matters what you do with tragedy. Susan Schneider, Robin Williams' late wife, she um, obviously grieved her husband and dealt with her um, emotional feelings, but she went into action. She met with lawmakers, doctors, researchers. She made a documentary so that people would know what happened to her husband to remove the stigma and to help families like mine. Um, another example of this is my own mom. Um, we had so many organizations, individuals, groups of people that helped us through caregiving um, and just the overall process of dealing with somebody with a neurological illness. And uh, after my father passed away, she went to get her master's in social work because she was passionate about helping others just like we were helped during the worst part of our lives. And then finally, your pain matters. Something that I went through after my dad died was I was still in college and my friends would come to me like normal friends and complain about their daily grievances of their normal lives. And I was so bitter. I just kept thinking, how dare you complain about this? Like, this is nothing. And I really struggled with that. Luckily, I never said those words out loud because they weren't pretty words. And I really had to do some self-reflection um, to understand where this was coming from. And I came up with this analogy. You have two friends. One friend broke their leg and one friend stubbed their toe. And it works both ways. If you're the friend that broke your leg and your friend came in and they're like, oh my gosh, I stubbed my toe. You have to acknowledge that that pain is real. It hurts when you stub your toe. And you're gonna be a bad friend and person if you don't help them through that pain. On the flip side, if you have the stubbed toe and your friend has a broken leg, yes, share with them about your pain and your life, but try to have some perspective and awareness about what your friend with the broken leg is going through. I think this is also extremely important in the world of 2020, whether you're grieving a lost loved one, whether you lost your job, or whether you're just working from home with little kids, and that's really hard. I think we have to acknowledge that everyone's going through something and pain is pain. So again, the three takeaways that I hope um, you take with you from my talk tonight is one, awareness matters. Two, what you do after tragedy matters. And three, your pain matters. Thank you. And thank you for letting me talk about the best man that I ever knew, my dad, Bob Williams.